I've gotten comments on a few videos about why I would use the settings that I used uh, while taking a particular photo. And this reminded me about a lie that I believed about camera settings for a long time. I'm Luke Cleland and I am a wedding photographer based in Toronto. And ever since starting this channel, it's only happened a couple of times, but I have gotten a few comments where they were just like, why did you have your ISO like this? Or why is your shutter speed so high? Or why did you do it this way? And it, it reminded me about, about this mindset that I had. And it lasted through several years of me beginning as a photographer. I believed that there was like this perfect camera setting that for every single photo I took, there was like the ultimate and perfect camera setting. So I always kind of felt a little embarrassed as self-conscious about the settings that I had chosen. And I remember thinking if I could just see what settings other photographers used on their photos, then kind of everything would just change for me and I would know the perfect golden settings. And guess what? It's not true. There is no perfect settings. So I want to liberate all you photographers out there to be free. Don't be self-conscious. Don't be concerned about what settings or embarrassed about what settings you're using. There are no perfect settings. And in this video, I'm going to tell you why. If you watch to the end, I'm going to show you some examples of some photos that perhaps people said you're using the wrong settings. And there's also a free PDF that I put together so that if you need a little bit of help on this, if you want a little cheat sheet that you can keep in your bag to help you kind of work through those settings, you can find that in the description of this video and also on my website. Now, to begin with, I am not the type of person that is like, everything is subjective, you can do whatever you want and it doesn't matter. No, I, I believe there are some some universal standards, some things that are kind of true beyond, you know, everyone, um, if that makes sense. However, uh, camera settings are just not like that. Uh, there is a range of correctness within camera settings. Camera settings are not like, I don't know, art class in elementary school where you just have like a pass or fail, just like correct or incorrect. That's that's not how it is. Uh, there are thousands of combinations. Um, I like to think of camera settings much more like cooking. Um, there are thousands of ways to make a chicken dinner, for example, right? You can make it really tasty and moist. You can make it really hard to eat, unflavorable, uh, dry, where you have to like drink something every time you eat the piece of chicken because it's so dry like the desert. There are so many different things that you can add to the chicken. <laughs> the only thing that you really have to worry about is salmonella. You just don't want to kill the person that you're cooking for. So I understand that I really got into chicken there, but the point is, is that you can have fun. Like as long as you cook the chicken, as long as you get the image to where you want it to be, you can do so many different combinations. You can have fun. You can have different ways of creating an image and that doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. Where I think this understanding comes from, it comes from when you have a really basic understanding of camera settings. Um, when you have the kind of Google version of what ISO does uh, or these like kind of short clips explaining settings. When you understand more and more of what camera settings actually do, that's when you have a more nuanced view of settings and it's not just like right or wrong. Like I, I think a good example of this is ISO. I think, well, I think this also had to do with older cameras when ISO was a lot more limited. But for example, it's like, well, low ISO means less noise. So you should shoot everything at ISO 100, right? Uh, and you should only ever shoot ISO, I don't know, 800 or 1000 when it's really dark. But that's not necessarily true. There are scenarios where you would use a higher ISO and it's not just related to low light. So how do you how do you feel more confident? How do you know if your settings are correct? How do you get the best settings for you and for what you're doing? And something that really helped me, well, there was two things. The first thing is that I started shooting on full manual. 
if you don't shoot on full manual, you're just not going to get the best understanding of how camera settings work. You're always going to be relying on your camera to make that decision. And if you start, I'm not saying use full manual for everything you shoot. I'm just saying use it more if you don't use it at all, especially when you're shooting on your own and you have time where you're just shooting for fun. Um, if you If you work your brain and have to figure out all of the settings, that's when you're really going to learn and comprehend how they all work with each other. The second thing is to create a little system for yourself and do the same thing over and over and over again until you get more confident with your camera settings. So, for example, choose the ISO and whenever you're setting up to take a photo, start with the ISO every single time. And as you're going through the three main settings, just ask yourself questions. Even saying out loud can be really helpful. Like, this is what I'm doing. I am choosing 800 ISO because it is a little dark and I need a little bit more exposure. And then take your camera and then be like, OK, so that's the ISO I'm setting at 800. Let's do the next one. The next one is aperture. Uh, I'm choosing a 1.2 aperture because I want that kind of low depth of field, uh, magical like look, blurry background look. But if I do that, that means that's going to be more exposed because a low aperture adds a lot of exposure. OK, uh, so let's do the third setting. I'm going to use the shutter speed to kind of fill the gaps between my decisions on my ISO and my aperture, because two of those decisions created a lot of light coming into my camera, which probably means, depending on the scenario, I need to use a little bit of a higher shutter speed in order for the picture to be properly exposed. And so you kind of keep looping around because maybe when you get to shutter speed, you realize you're like, oh, I'm at like five thousandth of a second already and my camera can't go higher. So I need to change my aperture. I need to change my ISO. Say those things out loud and kind of go in the same little system over and over again. If you're still kind of beginning and you need some help on figuring out how these three settings interact with each other, then definitely download that PDF and that should help you. So if you do that exercise over and over and over again, you're going to realize, OK, there's actually not one setting for my photo. There are different options. There's kind of a sliding range of like if I get more of this, I get less of that. And if I do less of that, I get more of this. So it's much more of a sliding range of acceptable settings rather than just like this one perfect setting. So now I'm going to show you four photos that I pulled up that I think are good examples of how camera settings can look wrong if you don't understand fully what's going on and you maybe don't fully understand the intent of the photographer. And I think this goes back to some of the comments where people looked at a photo I took and they said like, why would you have your ISO like that high? That doesn't make any sense at all. So let's go through it. The first one is this portrait of this beautiful bride. I've showed this photo on this channel before, and the settings are ISO 1600. It's shot on a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, the aperture was at 1.2 and the shutter speed was at 1 800th of a second. Now, what looks weird to you? Uh, I would say that if I had no idea what was going on, perhaps the ISO being at 1600 and the shutter speed being at 1 800th of a second seems weird, right? The ISO seems too high, like you could have brought that ISO down to 800 or 400 and also brought down the shutter speed because I'm not moving. This is a, this is a stationary portrait. Like, why did I choose these weird settings? Well, that's because as a wedding photographer, there are a million things going on at any given time. There is so many considerations that you have to have. You're never just in some sterile environment taking one photo and, and then you get just like the most, you know, ISO 100 where everything is just perfect and easy. No, when you're a wedding photographer, you're like thinking three steps ahead. You're thinking about what's going to happen now. What other photo am I going to have to take uh, two seconds after this shot? And that's the consideration that I had for this photo was I was doing portraits of the bride, but I was also turning and getting 
getting reactions of the people that were in the room. I am a photographer that does not like doing things over and over again. I let things happen as they go and I shoot them in the moment. And so what I have to think about a lot is not only the lighting scenario that I'm looking at, but often the lighting scenario behind me or to the side of me because there was her mom in the room, there was some bridal party members in the room, and what I was doing was shooting the portrait and then I would flip over and get a reaction shot of the mom, for example, watching her, her daughter getting ready for her wedding day. And so part of that consideration was the bride was in the brightest section of the room, but everyone else were in very dark areas of the room. And so what I had to choose was I actually chose a higher ISO so that when I was flipping between, I could move up the shutter speed to shoot the bride in this very bright area. But then when I moved over to get a reaction, all I had to do was flip down the shutter speed to an acceptable range. So I, w I didn't have to like move it down to like a fifth of a second and it just be blurry and horrible. I had to have it within a range that I could shoot two lighting scenarios very quickly and easily. Now, I already know what some of you are gonna say. Why don't you just do aperture priority and let your camera deal with the shutter speed? Okay, that is very valid. And there are times in my career that I have shot a lot on aperture priority. And that is, if you don't know what that is, that means you set the aperture, the camera figures out your shutter speed based on the lighting. Now, the thing is, you still have to set the camera's metering to be correct. And the issue is, is I shoot in so many different scenarios, I have a hard time um, getting the camera to do exactly what I want. Partly because I shoot for like, look at this photo, for example, it she's wearing a white dress and it's backlit. And then I'm going to be switching to people that aren't in a white dress that aren't backlit. And so even the camera would have a difficult time knowing exactly what I'm looking for in those two scenarios. And so I just find it that I like personally shooting all the wedding day in manual settings. The second photo is shot at ISO 2000. Uh, it's with a 35 millimeter prime lens. The aperture is at 1.8 and the shutter speed is 1. 6,400th of a second. Okay, same type of scenario. High ISO, high shutter speed, it seems excessive and redundant. Now, this photo was shot that way because I call it the best of the worst scenario. Sometimes you have to scramble to get the shot. Sometimes you see something happening so perfect and you only have a few, sometimes milliseconds to get your camera to the spot to take the photo. This was one of those scenarios where we were actually indoors. We were shooting at something which needed 2000 ISO. Uh, and then this exact spot at this venue here in Toronto is a very dark overhang with sometimes a very bright light coming in low. So this is the front of the venue. They were coming out of the venue. This was not an intended time to take photos, um, but we saw this exact thing happening and it was all of a sudden just like, oh, get it, get it, get it, poof, and shot it without, we don't ask them to be like, oh, can you come down the stairs and just like look effortless and like just hold your dress perfectly. No, 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 you just need it. You need to get it in the moment. And sometimes the settings are wild. Uh, but the point is, is that the settings could be a lot worse than this. And it isn't about necessarily getting the most perfect settings possible. In a moment like this, it's just getting the photo. And the great thing is about cameras that we use now, you know, 2000 ISO is not that big of a deal. Uh, like it definitely creates a little bit of noise, but if it's like, if it's, if the two options are either like, not get this photo at the perfect moment, but be at 400 ISO or get the perfect moment and be at 2000 ISO, I'm going to choose 5000 ISO every time. I'm going to choose 10,000 ISO if I'll get the perfect moment instead. And so, yeah, sometimes the settings are crazy looking and that's because maybe the actual scenario was a little crazy. The third scenario where you can have some weird settings is this one here. 
and that's ISO 1000. Uh, it's shot on a 50 millimeter lens. The aperture is at 2.5 and the shutter speed is at 1 400th of a second. So um, someone looking at this photo uh, would probably say being a little picky, a thousand ISO is a little high. Like, why would you not choose that? Why would you not choose a more idyllic setting, which is, you know, ISO 400, ISO 100? Well, that's because sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, for the cameras that we use, ISO 1000 really doesn't impact the image. And to be honest, a lot of the time, for even most of the wedding day, I'm shooting at a little bit of a higher ISO because it gives me some more flexibility. Uh, if you've ever shot a wedding, and I'm assuming a lot of you watching this have shot a wedding, you realize there's so many changing uh, lighting environments. You're inside, you're outside, you're under a tree, you're under an awning, you're in bright sun. The, a cloud came and co covered the sun, so it changed the lighting scenario. And sometimes I find just being at a little bit of a higher ISO, ISO 800, 1000, uh, it doesn't really affect the image, but it puts me in a setting position uh, that just gives me more flexibility. The last example of some weird settings is this photo right here of some details uh, of a reception. The ISO was 1600, shot on a 50 millimeter lens. The aperture was at 6.3 and the shutter was 1 40th of a second. Now, you look at some of those settings and it's hard to figure out what is going on. Like, why would you be shooting a stationary thing at 1 40th of a second? That's almost like a little dangerously low with a 50 millimeter lens. Um, but you're shooting at, you know, but you're shooting at a high aperture, you have a high ISO, what is going on? And the tricky thing about this is that there was very little natural light at all. Those settings are that way because I wanted to make it look like there is a window right next to these flowers. But in fact, I was using a lot of flash. And what I was realizing while I was setting up this shot was that I needed not only flash, but I also wanted as much ambient light as possible from the window uh, because there was a window about 50 feet away. I wanted some of that window light to kind of soften the flash, to blend it all together so that the photo would look good. Um, and that is the reason I have that really low shutter speed is because I was actually bringing in some ambient light to make the photo look how I wanted it to be. And so even though the settings look weird to you, sometimes it's because you don't actually fully realize what the lighting scenario looks like. The truth to the lie is that there are no perfect settings. Uh, settings are just tools to help you get the best image possible in the shooting scenario that you're in. And if you have made it all the way to the end of the video, wow, thanks, so nice to see you here. Uh, if you've already made it this far, you might as well hit subscribe if you haven't already, and that makes sure that you don't miss any future videos. Okay, see you in the next one.